Imagine you're a kid in the 1980s. You tolerate your homework, your nagging parents, but you really live for the weekends and summer vacation, that sweet taste of freedom. Times when you can spend the night at your friend's house playing Nintendo till who knows when, maybe ride your bikes into town to go catch a movie, or kill some time on a hot summer afternoon down by the lake. This might sound familiar to some of us who lived in the 1980s, or maybe have seen a lot of 80s movies, but things in the world of the loop are also markedly different. You see, rapid advances in technology in the 1950s and 60s have left a landscape that will look very unfamiliar in some ways. Flying vehicles are commonplace. Advances in artificial intelligence and robotics have produced some interesting results. There's rumors of strange beasts roaming the land, and government scientists are experimenting with things that they are trying to keep secret, but those secrets are beginning to leak out. If you and your friends are up for it, there's a whole lot of adventure and mystery to be solved here in Tales from the Loop. All right, so here we have it, guys. This is Tales from the Loop, role-playing in the 80s that never was. In other words, it's an alternate history 1980s. The cover is absolutely gorgeous, but uh, mine is kind of gross. I've taken this thing with me everywhere for the last few months, and uh, it is well-loved, we'll say. So my corner's a little bent, it's got a film of grossness. It also has this Any Winner sticker here. So yeah, this game won a whole lot of Ennies. Ennies, of course, are the RPG awards that take place every year at Gen Con, and this game cleaned up. So anyway, beautiful art on the cover, and all of the art throughout is also pretty nice. It is by Simon Stallenhog. He is the creator of the Loop universe, and did most of the art for this book. If I remember correctly, the game is actually inspired by his art and this world that he created. This RPG is Swedish, and uh, the translation I have is all, of course, in English, uh, but it's a Swedish company, Free League. I'd also like to uh, take a moment to thank Free League for sending me this stuff. They also sent me this dice set, a GM screen, and an adventure book, Our Friends the Machines and Other Mysteries. So this is not a paid promotional video, but I do thank them for sending that stuff my way. Uh, the book also came with this map, which is really nice, this larger map that shows the US loop. Yes, there is a US setting for this, and the Swedish loop. The design and layout is definitely a highlight of this book. This table of contents is absolutely lovely. Welcome to the loop here. It has a nice little story to kind of get you in the mood for what the adventures in this game might feel like. An example of play, lots of these examples of play throughout the book, and I think that's a great addition. To give you the brief overview first, in this game, a story is called a mystery. It deals with a group of friends who try to solve mysteries together. The friends are kids aged 10 to 15 years old, living in the late 1980s. Everyday life is full of nagging parents, never-ending homework, and classmates bullying and being bullied. Uh, anyway, it goes on from there, but basic feel for how a role-playing game works, rolling dice, and the principles of the loop. And this is a biggie. I have this page bookmarked because I wanted to make sure I read these to my players before we played. So the principles are, your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. When fusion particle accelerators and the magnetrine effect were discovered in the late 1950s, it broke the boundaries between the possible and the impossible. Huge transport vessels fly, cyborgs, robots can think, scientists create time portals, etc., etc., strange beasts, all kinds of weirdness. So there's a familiarity in the 1980s, but there's this fantastical element that is also added. Everyday life is dull and unforgiving. So while there's some fantastical elements, you're still kids in the 1980s and you still have to deal with school and nagging parents and all of this stuff. And yeah, I guess the way that I think, and I don't know if I got this from one of my players who said this or if it was from somewhere in the book, but I think of it like when you see these fantastical things, it would be like me when I was a kid seeing the blue angels fly overhead, these fighter jets that flew to shows and stuff, and they were amazing. There was something that was breathtaking about them. At the same time, it was like, you know, these, these exist. It's cool to see, but everyday life was not full of those things. <laughs> uh, adults are out of reach and out of touch. This element really adds to the game because it's not gonna be possible in the game for these kids, ages 10 to 15, to just go to their parents or go to the police. That is not gonna be a valid solution to the problems the game presents and it wouldn't be very fun 
if it was. So the adults aren't going to believe you, or they're going to act like they're too busy with other things, or it's not a priority, or whatever. The land of the loop is dangerous, but kids will not die. That's an important principle. You can get hurt, you can get locked up, you can get all kinds of other damage, but you're not going to die in this game. The game is played scene by scene. So this could be scenes that the players actually act out individually with the game master. Like in the beginning and end of the game, each kid acts out a scene from daily life. Maybe the game master plays their dad or their mom or uh, the neighbor kid or whatever it is. And then in between the beginning and end scenes, which really help tell the story of who these characters are, there is also scenes where all the characters are together and they're going about overcoming trouble and solving problems. And lastly, the world is described collaboratively. So it's all about collaborative storytelling here. That's the focus. You're not gonna see much by way of combat in this game. It is a storytelling heavy, role-playing heavy game that does still use some dice to help tell the story and to determine certain results. All right, this is about the age of the loop. I'm gonna skip through this pretty quick, but it talks all about the Swedish loop in this chapter. One important part for our purposes here is the technology. It talks about the culture of the 80s, but it also talks about this new technology, Rick's Energy in Sweden, the loop, civilian technology, military technology, and how magnetrine flight works. So this is important flavor stuff for kind of getting a feel for the setting and the unique aspects of it. Personally, having grown up in the 80s and 90s, I don't need much of a primer on the 80s and the culture there, but some people might. However, that technology and the more fantastical side of things, I, I really do need to hear more about. Look at this, 10 tabletop RPGs. Cool. <laughs> Getting a little bit meta there. Top music videos. Uh, Boulder City is in Nevada. And here's a map of that setting. Some locations. And there you have it. So that's a bit on the setting and the basics of the game. Now we get into the kids and we'll get a little more specific on the rules here as well. So kids, character creation is pretty quick. For me, we did it together and it probably took about 30 minutes to create our characters together. Here's an example of the character sheet. So basically you have attributes and skills that are related to those attributes. Conditions are suffered when things go wrong and can give you a penalty. And you have all this basic stuff. So this is the type. Let's go through it. You've got your bookworm, your computer geek, your hick, jock, popular kid, rocker, troublemaker, weirdo. And then with each type, you have some suggestions. And these are mostly suggestions. Your key skills don't change. The computer geek is going to have calculate, program, and comprehend. The Jock is going to have force, move, and contact. So that means that the numbers you have in those will likely be bigger. However, you do get lots of options for what item. And you can even make up your own. Choose one or make up your own for a lot of these things. For the iconic item, the problem, drive, what drives you. Your pride, what makes you feel good. Our relationships to other kids, and that's a really cool aspect of the game that you would write in right here, is that in character creation, you're actually deciding, okay, how do we know one another? And your relationship to certain NPCs as well. Your anchor is someone who you can go to when you're in trouble or when you want to overcome conditions. And then you even have some typical names here, girls' names, boys' names. You've got some Swedish names and some American names. Your age, you choose between 10 and 15 years old, and you can choose, but if you choose a 15 year old, understand you might not be playing that character very long. A 10 year old is going to have a lot more luck points, but an older kid is going to have higher attribute scores. So do you want more luck points or do you want higher attribute scores? That's kind of the thing you have to weigh. It now goes into more explanation for each of the parts of character creation here. One thing I didn't talk about is the hideout. The kids have a hideout together, a place where they can be alone and safe. So they should decide what that is together. For my group, it was an old school bus in a junkyard that they had made to look kind of like a magnetrine ship. I thought that was a great idea. It was a lot of fun. And then you have these questions here. And these are just things you can ask your group as you start the game, maybe to kind of get in character a little bit more and get to develop your characters and get to know each other. The next chapter gets into trouble, so here's where we get to how the game works mechanically. So here it is. Let's take out some dice. 
First off, the dice that come with it are very nice. I like them a lot. They've got this symbol for the six, which is success, and the rest have a pretty standard looking symbol there. The GM might tell you to roll to determine results for certain things. Not everything, some things might just happen, but the GM can kind of decide that. We use our attributes and our skills to determine how many dice we get to add to our dice pool. Sixes are success. The more sixes, the better. So let's say that I have two in body and I have three in force. Okay, so that means I would get two plus three and I'd be rolling five total dice. Sixes are successes. I dropped one on the ground, I have to re-roll it even though it was a six. I got a six again, okay, good. <laughs> so I got one success. So in general, one success is gonna be good enough for most normal situations. But for extremely difficult situations, you might make a player need two successes or even three successes. If you get extra successes, you can actually buy extra effects. The GM screen definitely comes in handy for a lot of this stuff. As you notice right here, it has all these options for what you can do to buy extra effects, as well as summaries of a lot of the other rules. So definitely very handy to have the GM screen and avoid having to flip through the book a lot. It also has some pretty nice art on it, although I would prefer, I think, that it had something more similar to the uh, cover of the core book art. Still, very nice looking scene. If you fail a roll, in many cases, you will have to suffer a condition. Usually you can choose what that means and which one makes most sense for that given situation. But this is gonna mean that you have a negative one to all rolls for each condition you have. So if I'm injured and upset, I have a negative two to all my rolls. And there are some ways that you can overcome those and heal some of those conditions. You can also choose to push the roll and that means that you kind of take a little extra risk and try again, but there's also that possibility of penalty in terms of suffering more conditions. Kids can help each other. And then you get this section on extended trouble, which is kind of the, the major culminating encounter. Think of it as a boss fight, but a lot of the times you're not fighting enemies, so to speak, in here. Uh, you are overcoming challenges. Again, not, lots of nice examples of gameplay here to give you a feel for how it all works. Explanation of all the skills, which I'll skip through, but those are in there. Pretty easy to learn, I found. And then you have this section on the mystery. This chapter, if it were a D&D &D book, would probably be called like planning an adventure or something like that. So the way that mysteries work in this game are usually gonna be fairly similar. There's a similar structure. I'll show you an outline here of how it might work. You might have a very linear path clue one, clue two, clue three, and then showdown, but generally you're gonna have three clues, and maybe the players don't need them all, and then a showdown. And you can see these various options for structuring. Now, you don't have to follow these. You'll notice that there is a little bit more of a sandboxy option over here, and this would probably be for a much bigger mystery than just a, like a three-hour mystery, or possibly even a mini campaign with something like this. So usually you're going to introduce the mystery, you're going to play out some scenes from everyday life for the kids, and then you're going to find some way to bring about the mystery to them so that they are put on a path to start trying to solve it and figure out and uh, investigate clues. They might travel to various locations, they might have to do research or talk to certain NPCs. They might go to the library and look some things up because guess what, there weren't smartphones in the 1980s. And then in the end you get the showdown, which is just kind of that big culminating encounter. And there's, the stakes are high. When you roll dice in that final showdown, it feels really amazing. It's really exciting and uh, it was a lot of fun. And here you have the mystery landscape in chapter seven. This is all about how you can kind of run a more sandboxy style campaign. They give you location, they give you the truth, hooks, countdown, and NPCs. And um, each one of these locations could have many different possible storylines and mysteries that you could choose between. So that's really cool. It makes it so that you can kind of give your players free roam of this area and they can then get into trouble and you can kind of 
pull on some of these hooks. So that section is much more sandboxy and free form, but now you get into some pre-written adventures. And these are really good. There's four of them in this book. It's one of the reasons I think this book is a really good value. It's not just giving you the rules for the game and for character creation. It's giving you four adventures. They could be played separately or they could be played all four in order or just two of them. Uh, it's really very flexible. I did play with my group the first one and we had a lot of fun. Definitely hoping to play some more of them sometime soon. One critique I will say for the adventures here in the book is that I wish there were little kind of text boxes set apart like in a D&D book for me to read to my players so that when they enter a location, I have two or three or four sentences that I can read to just give my players a feeling for what they see or what they hear in this location. They don't really have that here. Instead, I'm reading all of this right here and I'm not quite sure what to tell my players because I don't wanna give out too much unless they're actually looking for it and you get the idea. So yeah, I do wish they just had maybe a little text box that I could just read to my players like in a D&D 5th edition book. And then of course I can keep reading if I want to give them more detail as they investigate further. They do have some really nice maps throughout here. You have the houses of these people. I didn't play with maps and miniatures or anything like that. I think this game would be pretty hard to play that way overall because it's just so freeform. But it is nice that they have some maps here and you can show these to your players and say, all right, you're standing right here, he's right there. But these scenes are very brief compared to the overall adventure. If you're coming to this looking for a fairly combat heavy game where you know I'm rolling this and you're rolling that and we're trying to use all these special abilities, it is not going to be like that at all. It is a game that puts the emphasis on storytelling and role play and solving mysteries. At the back of each adventure, they have a section for some of the major NPCs that they're encountering earlier in the adventure. So that's kind of cool. Big section, by the way, in the back for all the Kickstarter backers. Before I share some summarizing thoughts on the system here, I did want to mention that our friends, The Machines and Other Mysteries is a really cool book. It does have our friends, The Machines, which I am planning to run in just a couple weeks, actually, at our local convention, Grand Con, here in West Michigan. So that should be a lot of fun. And then it's also got Horror Movie Mayhem, The Mummy in the Mist, mixtape of mysteries, which I would describe as very similar to the mystery landscape section in here. Kind of some sandboxy locations, adventure hooks and NPCs, pretty cool. Then you've got some actual blueprints from some of the machines of the loop, and then how you can hack your hometown. And that's kind of what this map is about. They give an example of how you could make your own loop in your own hometown and some of the elements you'll make you want to make sure that you include in that. So that's also pretty cool. So it's probably pretty clear that I'm a big fan of this game. Now, one thing that I don't think I made very clear is where does that term the loop come from? Well, you can see on the map probably, but there's this circular area around the particle reactors in each of the maps. And that area around the particle reactor, kind of the center where DARPA or Rix Energy is doing a lot of their experiments, is called the loop. And a lot of the strangeness is happening within that area. Now it's pretty obvious that a game like Tales from the Loop is probably heavily inspired by Stranger Things, which has kind of seen this resurgence in a lot of 80s pop culture. Stranger Things, of course, itself is taking inspiration from E.T., Stand By Me, The Goonies, and lots of other 80s movies featuring kids. It's worth noting that there are a few other games that are trying to do this too. Games like Dark Places and Demogorgons and Kids on Bikes. While it's hard to say that Tales from the Loop beats those other systems because it's just such a different game, it's really, I think, impossible to say that any of them beat this. It's so good. It's so well produced. And I think that you'd be hard pressed if you're looking for kind of a Stranger Things-esque experience I think this is probably the best way to go. Where I think this game really shines is in how the tone and environment work together to just create this very evocative feeling. The art all adds to it as well, and you just feel like you know this place. It draws you in. And the other thing is, I think the rules are very elegant and simple, and I think that it creates a lot of tension in the way that you roll dice. You actually don't want to roll dice all that often. If you're looking at your character sheet and trying to figure out, can I roll for this and can I roll for that? You're probably just going to be adding a lot of conditions because you're going to fail sometimes. 
Rather, the game rewards creative thinking and cooperation. And when you do roll dice, there is such a great feeling of tension that just seems to build throughout the mystery. By the time you get to the extended trouble, the players are all working together and scheming how they're going to accomplish this task, and then it all comes down to the dice. Succeed or fail, what is going to happen? When my players were doing this, they started by rolling lots of dice, counting up all the sixes, see how many successes they needed, but by the end, they were actually rolling them one by one and just waiting, just two more sixes, two more sixes, throwing those dice, and in the end, they did not get the sixes they need, they did not accomplish the task that they set out to do, and there was this great feeling of disappointment, and yet there were smiles all around because we had just told this amazing story together, and it was a lot of fun. Now, before I go, it's worth noting that though this game does feature 10 to 15 year old kids, I don't think this game is for kids. It does have some fairly mature content. There is a little bit of hint at sexual content. There are some abusive relationships mentioned. And the level of intensity and kind of danger and peril involved, I think is not suitable for kids. It's not something I'm going to play with my kids. My oldest is nine right now. It's also worth noting that this game is just a very different style if you're used to playing something like D&D. Again, the focus is on narrative, storytelling, cooperation, and problem solving. And I think that that might be a little bit hard for some groups to adjust to. But I definitely hope some of you give it a shot. I'll put some links to where you can buy this game down in the video description. I think the core book is usually between $30 and $40, and I think it's well worth it. And I definitely hope some of you check this out. Those of you who have played it, tell me some of your stories. What have you enjoyed about it? What don't you like about it? I always love to hear from you. If you're going to be at Grand Con this year, I'd love to meet you, and maybe you can even get in my Tales from the Loop game. Lastly, before I go, I'd like to thank my patrons for their support. Patrons are amazing people. They help support this channel on a monthly basis and make sure these videos keep coming. I want to thank them so much, and you too can join with them. Just go to the Patreon link down in the video description. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Take care. You'll see me again very soon.